Tonight we're going to have uh, the second half of uh, Acts chapter 8. Pastor John did such a good job with the first half of chapter 8, and when we meet together as preachers and give each other feedback, we said, John, you've got too much material, you've got to come back, so here he is to lead us through the conversions in Acts. Hi, it's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you for coming. I'm just so glad that we can be here. I enjoyed the worship so much that we connect with the Spirit, with God, and we get filled with joy. And let, please pray with me. Lord, I just ask that your Spirit would continue to just be present with us in abundance, Lord, that we be able to just be lifted up by your Holy Spirit this evening, that uh, whatever is spoken, just... Uh, use it to glorify yourself, Lord, and, and uh, help us on our journey of faith with you. We praise you today. You are a loving and awesome God, and we lift our voices in response to just glorify and praise you, Jesus. Amen. So I, I also work here at the school with the junior high. I've been doing that for about 35 years in case I seem a little weird. You know why? But um, anyway, when I look at them, a lot of times I think back to my own childhood experiences. And, you know, as I was looking at this message, which has a magician, and I was thinking about a magic show that I was drawn into. My family thought, oh, we're going to surprise him on his birthday and his cousins, and we're going to go and take him to this magic show. And I think they set it up beforehand with the magician that they were going to get me on stage, and I was going to be part of it. And before I knew it, even though I was an introvert, there I was putting the cabbage in the guillotine that he had taken the black cloth off of and then stepping back as he instructed and he pulled the little string and poof, it chopped that cabbage right in half. And um, I, I hardly remember what happened after that other than the fact that I was in that place of the cabbage and, and very uncomfortable with the whole thing. And, and uh, well, but... Um, you know, as far as I know, I kept my head and I walked away from that experience uh, all right. But we're going to kind of zoom in and ask this evening. We're going to look at two men. One is Simon the Magician um, and the appearance of faith, which turns out about to be now you see it, now you don't. Uh, just it wasn't real faith. It was not authentic faith. It was counterfeit. And then we'll contrast him with someone who did experience conversion and real faith and the rejoicing that goes along with that. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. And the, we've been in Acts, which is like the, just the work, the powerful work of the Holy Spirit to bring people to God and with authenticating miracles and a Holy Spirit inspired faith, but also like opposition by Jewish leaders. And last time I had a message to share with you it was 8 1 to 8 and uh, verses 14 to 17 about how persecution had scattered the church in Jerusalem and they had gone to Judea and Samaria. Persecution resulting in the growth of the church. Uh, amazing, but exactly what God had planned and happened. And uh, then we also looked at the apostles going down to confirm this and how the Holy Spirit worked through the apostles to unite the Jerusalem, the Jewish and the Samaritan believers into one church. There had been division there for centuries and they were brought together as one. And the, the pleasure that our unity here this evening brings to God and, and the unity that he created in these believers. So this week, the title of the message is Faith Check. And um, last week we skipped verses 9 to 13 to include it uh, with this one, 9 to 13, Simon, the appearance of faith, and then verses 18 to 24 turned out not to be counterfeit, faith is what it was, and then we'll finish with 8, 25 to 40, Philip and the Ethiopian, uh, authentic faith. So uh, I'll read uh, from a New American Standard Version, uh, Acts 8, uh, 9 to 13, um, and then uh, 18 to 24, all in one reading. I'll tell you when we uh, jump the verses. 
Now, a man named Simon had previously been practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And all the people from small to great were paying attention to him, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they were paying attention to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip as he was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were being baptized. Now even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was repeatedly amazed and then jumping to verse 18 now when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles hands he offered them money saying give this authority to me as well so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit but Peter said to him may your silver perish with you because you thought you could acquire the gift of God with money You have no part or share in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart will be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of unrighteousness. But Simon answered and said, pray for the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you said may come upon me. So in this section, we see first the appearance of faith, but then the marks of counterfeit faith. So Simon had been practicing magic, astonishing people, and claiming to be someone great. When the Bible talks about magic, it's not talking about sleight of hand. It's talking about connection with the occult, with demonic powers, uh, denying uh, Christ and serving self is kind of the demonic motto and he harnessed the power of deception and he astonished and had the attention of the people they they even said this man is the power of god that is called great notice it said even simon i think this was not a person one would expect to believe okay so what are we to make of this well simon was given uh to being impressed by these signs and Uh, that Philip did, and he felt a power above his own, I think, and uh, he had a faith, the kind that James speaks of, a faith of mental ascent only. It hadn't reached the heart. He hadn't really repented and surrendered himself to Christ. In short, he hung on to self and his personal claim to greatness. So, The first mark here, counterfeit faith exalts the individual. Genuine faith exalts Jesus Christ, and may his name be praised. We preach not ourselves, says the Apostle Paul, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5, counterfeit faith offers another mediator, a personality, A real faith in Jesus offers direct contact, a personal relationship under his saving lordship. And we've seen how dangerous this personality-based faith can be. I don't know if you remember Jim Jones and Guiana and just, you know, hundreds of people under this uh, despot, really this personality that eventually wanted everyone to die. So real faith in Jesus, direct contact a personal relationship with Jesus. So in order to have this, people must see themselves as as they are, as needing to be saved and humble themselves. Pride stands in the way of that happening. It's the poor in spirit, not the proud of heart, that experience saving faith. We know that from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 3. And faith is a yielding to Christ that results in obedience. Uh, Simon was not converted. In our last study, we saw that Peter and John were used in Samaria to unite the believers. And here the Holy Spirit works through Peter to expose Simon and to keep the church pure. And but also to offer the opportunity to repent. This is so important, I think. Peter's response revealed that Simon's heart was not right before God. Peter had the gift of discernment, was calling him out on this. And Uh, His condition is described as in the gall of bitterness. 
excessive bitterness, uh, probably bitterness magnified because his position of prestige in the community was, was losing. It's like, you know, hey, you apostles, you're stepping on my air hose here. My followers are going down. Um, but uh, he continued that uh, Simon was also in the bondage of unrighteousness. And this is a phrase used in the Old Testament to indicate the most serious offenses against God. So Simon's heart was in actuality set against God. And Peter tells him plainly, you and your money are both going to hell if you don't change your attitude. He must personally repent. And you guys know repent was like a military term, means about face. Basically, it was that you are going away from God. You need to turn around and go towards him. Um, but there was no repentance there. Instead, Simon turned it back to Peter. You pray for me. So historical accounts uh, by church leaders after the apostles indicate that this person, Simon Magnus, became an opponent of the gospel. And his followers were named, uh, called Simonians, and he preached a false gospel based on secret knowledge, known as Gnosticism. Um, so Jesus told us that it would be like this in the church. There would be, you know, he told us the parable of the wheat and the tares. There's going to be both true believers and false believers. And does, do you think that makes me think about my faith? You bet it does. I want to have a saving faith. Uh, I don't want to have a fake faith. Um, so um, how can we apply this? Well, first I'm thinking, what has our attention you know, clever deception, promoting self-indulgence, uh, or, or life-giving truth, promoting Christ-likeness in us. Are we seeing that growth? Scripture tells us a tree is known by its fruit. Uh, so we're, a man is known by his words and deeds. And this is how we can check our own faith. The words that we speak are coming from our heart. They reveal what's in our heart. And so what do we hear ourselves saying? Is it in line with scripture? And what about our actions? What do we see? Are we living out denying self and serving Christ? Are we like really living into this idea of repentance? Because we all, you know how we are. We constantly have to have this idea of repentance, getting rid of the old, quitting what's wrong about the way we're living and rejecting it and heading again towards God and to letting him empower us to live for him, to live in a way that pleases him. So repentance. Uh, you know, training to detect counterfeit money concentrates on studying real bills. They just study and study real bills until they know them so well. When a counterfeit one comes along, they can easily identify it. And so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to take a look at authentic faith. And I was thinking, too, we can study authentic faith. We see it in the scripture. We see it in the characters of scripture. We see it especially in Christ. His faith is amazing. You know, not as I will, but as you willing to go to the cross. What, what trust, what faith, what obedience. But we can learn that from each other as well. Um, so real faith, that's this next section uh, Acts 8, 25 to 40. I'll read it. So when they, Peter and John, had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get ready and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So we got ready and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge, of all her in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join his chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to slaughter and like a lamb that is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his justice was taken away. 
Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth. Beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered that the chariot stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So Peter and John returned to Jerusalem. Uh, They're leading the church there, and they're preaching as they go. Uh, In your going, make disciples. That's the commission. He uses us to do the same, and that's what Peter and John do all the way back. Only God can overcome the things that people uh, keep people from being saved. One is a man is dead in in his trespasses and sins. He cannot respond. Respond. God has to make alive that will to be able to receive, and he has the power to do that. He also has the power to stop Satan, the one who snatches away the truth and, and attempts to blind people to it, but God is greater than Satan. And in this case, he sends an angel to speak to Philip, and Philip commands the, obeys the command of the angel. So I just thought, do angels still work today? Yes, but not usually visibly. The scripture says they are ministering spirits sent forth to serve those who shall be the heirs of salvation. So I like to think that they're at work in our lives, touching and helping us. We just don't see them. So Philip gets specific directions. Go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a very deserted, no cities, no villages. You couldn't find an emptier stretch of road. But it was the assignment given by the angel, and he obeys it. Because God has set up a meeting that's going to take the gospel to Africa. How? By conversion to Christ of an Ethiopian eunuch. This is an African man of great responsibility, the secretary of the treasury of Ethiopia, the ancient kingdom of Cush. And he's got authority and influence throughout all of Ethiopia and Egypt. He works with the queen. Her name's not actually Candace. That's her title, meaning female royal ruler. Um, So he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. uh, And uh, being a eunuch, he couldn't become a full Jew. He couldn't go into the temple. The Old Testament scriptures forbid it. But he came away um, still searching for what would satisfy his soul. God is a rewarder of those who seek him. So this is a, you know, we are uh, called to do that. We're not inclined to do that, with, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do that. So he also came away with a scroll containing the writings of the prophet Isaiah. And so I think he's looking for that which will make sense of life and satisfy the soul. And he seeks this truth in the revelation of scriptures. This is a mark of a godly man or woman. That that is where we need to look for truth. Uh, I love Psalm 1 and verse 2. It says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. So uh, the Bible tells us that scripture speaks of and reveals Christ, John 5, 9. And Paul says of the gospel in Romans 1.16, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So the eunuch is about to be led through the scriptures to Jesus Christ. So the stage is set. He's sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah. The spirit urges Philip, go up and join his chariot. Philip ran up, heard him reading Isaiah 53.7. Philip's bold. It's likely this man's traveling with servants and bodyguards. He's an important person. Uh, Philip says just the right words. Do you understand what you're reading? And this touches an interest and need that this man has. And the Ethiopian said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? Those words show humility and a teachable spirit. He invites Philip to come up and sit with him. 
Philip sees, hey, this is a teachable moment. I have a green light. Uh, he ex explains the scripture. The, the man is wondering about a specific verse, uh, Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. I am sure you can relate to this. He's led like a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb. You, you just know who is talking about already. Of course, the Ethiopian didn't. So I'm sure he was taken deeper into that scripture. Uh, I've been, you know, pierced for your iniquities. Other Isaiah scriptures that revealed this uh, because um, this was a passage that had puzzled the Ethiopian and puzzled a lot of people uh, because in the Old Testament, most of the pictures we find of the coming Messiah depict him coming in triumph, in power, in glory, in victory, riding over the enemies of Israel as the great king and who would restore peace on earth. But this passage is about Jesus, the suffering Savior, Jesus who suffered false accusations, mock trials, insults, beatings, crucifixion, the cross where Jesus satisfied the demands of justice and gave himself and paid in full for mankind's sins, for, for my sins, for your sins. The telestai paid in full, turn the page. No shame, leave it behind. It's finished, okay, paid for. So um, this passage is about the suffering Messiah, so note that this presentation of the gospel starts in Scripture, centers on it, um, for the power of salvation is in the word, and then Philip focuses on Jesus Christ, and he, I'm sure, told the man who Jesus was, what he did. I think Philip may very well have seen the resurrected Christ. He lived in the same lifetime, and um, so... Uh, Philip wasn't thinking, oh, man, this guy's chariot's going the wrong way. I get to get off here and start walking home. No, he, he was committed to really being with the Ethiopian and sharing faith. And so the eunuch says, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Obviously, like there's something that happened between the lines here, right? Um, you know, I, I think we have a between the lines confession of repentance uh, accepting uh, of Jesus as God and therefore as Lord, reception as Savior, his sins paid for, and then a realization uh, of his entry into the blessings of God rather than his wrath. And to me, that's all confirmed by Philip's willingness to baptize him, that, that between the lines of what went on. The man embraced the reality of Jesus and um it says that he went on his way rejoicing. And, you know, I, I'm thinking, well, how about us? What is our joy level? I mean, joy is like kind of a contagious thing. Like we're, we're like wanting to share Christ. We're wanting to have somebody see something about us that maybe isn't like abundantly present in our world today. And what could it be? Could it be joy? Could it be like, you know, some kind of like flag flying on the castle of our heart? Not just that deep sense of well-being, but wow, I'm saved. My eternity is in heaven. My Savior is sovereign and all-powerful, and he loves me, and he's changing me, and, I, and I, I have, I'm able to have successful relationships and be, be all, all that, just uh, all the reason for, for joy that we have, uh, the you know, the eunuch went on his way, in my view, demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit, joy, uh, the joy of salvation. And uh, Philip himself, it says, um, the Lord snatched him away. And um, I don't want to, like, you know, it is interesting. This could be a miraculous transport. But just what, however it happened, the key thing was that Philip kept on preaching wherever he went and settled. He just kept, kept doing that. So they both demonstrate elements of authentic Christianity. Philip, the motivation to share the gospel. I hope we have that, that we're praying for an opportunity to do that. Uh, also, a recognition of a teachable moment when it, when it comes up with somebody, the opportunity. The Ethiopian's humble and teachable spirit. We need to maintain that, ask God for that. And then his acceptance of, of the truth, look, finding truth in Christ um, and the willingness to be obedient. Um, 
So I, I think these are all elements of authentic faith in action, this willingness to obey. Philip went to a completely deserted desert road, nothing there, but there was that willingness. And the uh, Ethiopians' enthusiastic request to be baptized, just faith in action. And then lifestyle. Philip's continuing to preach, the Ethiopian going on his way, uh, rejoicing. And um, early, Irenaeus, an early church leader, wrote regarding the Ethiopian eunuch. He went uh, into the regions of Ethiopia to preach what he had himself believed. So this idea of, of multiplying, that we're called to witness. We don't need to be theologians. We just need to know what God has done in our lives and be willing to share it with other people. And then um, hopefully be able to just make it very simple that separ sin separated man from God, that Jesus Christ took the sin out of the picture on himself, that that left the opportunity for God and man to be reunited in a relationship, and uh, that that's something that should be taken advantage of, that relationship with God will fill the void in our life. So the challenge here. Are we open to the sovereign Holy Spirit overriding our plans and using us in ways we don't anticipate? Are we learning our Bible? Do we accept the truth scripture reveals? Do we have a humble and teachable spirit? Are we living a life of repentance and transformation by continually yielding to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Are we motivated to share the gospel in word and deed to the stranger, to the hungry, to the thirsty, to the sick, to the naked, to the imprisoned? And finally, uh, does our relationship with Jesus produce joy in our lives? We're not looking for perfection. Only God is perfect. We're looking for progress in our transformation progress. Is ours a saving faith? It's it's so important to consider. It's worth considering. It could be the difference between hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, or uh, depart from me. I never knew you. So let's check our own hearts. and Please pray with me. God, um, you are the author and finisher of our faith. We're dependent upon you to save us. You are sovereign over all. You're merciful. You're compassionate. You're patient. You're gracious. You're good. You're generous. May ours be a real saving faith that gives us eternity with you and brings you glory. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Before I pronounce the benediction, just repeating a few key points from Pastor John's sermon. The difference between a genuine conversion and a counterfeit conversion. In a genuine conversion, Jesus is exalted. In a counterfeit one, self is exalted. A genuine conversion results in a personal relationship with Jesus. A counterfeit relies on a personality. Pride is with the counterfeit. Being poor in spirit and humble is with the genuine one. And the genuine yields and obeys the counterfeit still needs to repent to come into the arms of Jesus. So let's be like that Ethiopian, humble enough to, to know when we don't understand something, seeking answers from those who have answers in God's word, receive the truth, and then receive Jesus. And let that joy level get over your head. Ah, oh, just let's drown in the joy. So the benediction tonight is from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. God bless you. Next week, I'll be bringing the, the conclusion of the series, The Church Without Walls. <laughs>